Hi everyone. Um, it's great to be back. I did say yeah, I will be back. <laughs> um, okay, so um, my abstract has changed, my paper has changed, so sorry to those who read about a week before. <laughs> it's no longer on the ham, though the ham, as Mark notes, <laughs> is with us, um, <laughs> taking its revenge. Um, so I'm going to talk about sonic fiction and about uh, Audint. Audint is a research cell investigating how frequencies are used to demar demarcate the soundscape. Reformatted in 2008, it consists of both artists and scholars and has produced a series of unsound installations, films, talks, records, book projects, performances and exhibitions. A collection of recordings, writings and illustrations were released in 2014 as Marshall Hauntology, a project investigating deceptive frequency-based strategies, technologies and programs developed by, by military organizations since, since 1944 to orchestrate the spectral phenomena of a haunting within an area of conflict. I will start by playing a snippet from one side of the record that accompanies the Marshall Hauntology book. <laughs> Delusions of the Living Dead, Phantom Chapter 1.1 It's 1949, and Auden, Sleppin, Arnett and Horton are discussing how those with extreme psychological disorders might react to the tests carried out on their engineer, Edward Schuler, which has resulted in him conversing with the dead. Meetings with Theodore Reich, whose research in Facebook, The Secret Self, have been rich and varied. One line of inquiry involves the work of French neurologist Jules Cotard into a condition that renders those afflicted believing they have no blood and that their body is without organs. Ultimately, it causes them to think that they are dead. When Reich tells of hushed rumors alluding to a notebook containing instructions on how to induce Cotard's syndrome, audience are captivated. They speculate on deploying their two-ring table on those who believed they were already deceased. Would this alter the dynamics of communication with the other world voices? Could they transform carriers into necromancy drones by playing hooks from regular vinyl records? Having spent months unearthing stories that corroborate a rumor which locates the notebook in Paris, it is decided Slepian will return to France for the first time since the ghost army departed after World War II. His nomination, due to a patchy knowledge of the language, garnered from reading Proust à la recherche de Pont Perdu. Much lower this time. Under the influence of a future-oriented riff, a female voice begins our phantom tour in the world of audience. An undercover audio intelligence cell and their mission to purloin Jules Cotard's recipe for inducing extreme psychological disorders at will. In the modus operandi set by Philip K. Dick, she may be talking about a recent discovery or something that does not exist at all. Therefore, she is free to say everything or nothing. She speaks of characters, places and schemes from the history of Audint, formed in the wake of World War II on the back of a tactical deception unit known as the Ghost Army. Ghosters were a different kind of soldier, actors, sound technicians, artists, and other creative types, whose mission was to misinform the Nazis about the whereabouts of the Allied forces by constructing fake tanks, soundscapes, and radio transmissions. From its inception, Audint was attuned to the power of cultural artifacts to produce reality and to leak into the social. Flash forward to 2008, and Audint is making a comeback in the hands of Toby Hayes and Steve Good Goodman, who claim to be agents operating under the direction of IRIX2. The latter is a runaway sonic algorithm that escaped and survived the human members of Audint who built, who built it in the 90s by entering the then new domain of the internet and mutating <coughs> into an online spectral web. Hayes and Goodman have become its meat puppets fleshy hard drive and neural storage 
for the downloading of its 63-year-old memory from the activity of audit. The reasoning behind the selection of Hayes and Goodman is their audiovisual, web-based recording and academic activity, especially when these projects converge with the study of frequency-based phenomena. Flash forward again. 2014 sees the release of Marshall Hontology, a custom limited edition box set comprising of a single clear vinyl record, a 112 page book and uh, six 12 by 12 inch annotated cards. This collection is dubbed the Dead Record Archive and features the likes of Alan Turing, Antonin Artaud, Theodore Reich, Thomas Edison, as well as historical figures you never knew existed. Marshall Hontology is the culmination of a research project investigating the properties of psychoacoustic manipulation in social and military environments, particularly focusing on the impact of the collision of sound or the sound clash. Sorry, I completely that. As Odin discover, when reified, collision produces a vibratory force that mutates the physical, emotional, economic and architectural format of a time and space in ways that have not been heard before. By extension, it is the collision in all its vibratory formats and excesses that interests Odin. It is their mission to probe the peripheral zones of sound, those frequencies such as infrasound and ultrasound that exist at the perceptual boundaries, what they term unsound. As they deduce, given that all sensory information could be considered to be spectral in essence, those frequencies above and below the thresholds of human hearing become interfaces for understanding how perceptual mechanisms within us have been deactivated, much like genes that have been trip switched by extreme experiences. Flash back to 1947. One of the most significant outcomes in audience inquiry on what else vibration can do leads to the, intervent to the invention, discovery, of a phantom sense that once allowed us to communicate with what exists on the edges of, wave of waveformed perception. This is the third year, frequency-based cellular instrument that exists within all of us, dead or living, and beholds a regressed capacity to connect to asymmetric worlds, to other times and spaces, and to other forms of vibratory intelligence. This is an extrasomatic channel that can be fully activated for communication with other worldly, other world, worldly presences, a potentially augmented device allowing contact with voices from the past, present, and future. The third year confirms an old suspicion associated with recording and communication technologies from the beginning about the potential of sound, infrasound, and ultrasound to create domains of the undead, anomalous zones of transmission between realms of the living, realms of the living and the dead. According to information revealed in martial ontology, the significance of the third year extends from its development in the 40s to future events that have yet to unfold. Thus far, the project uncovers links between the underground groove of the Large Hadron Collider, the vaults of the back of hell, connects the dead record network with a phantom hailer, and traces the evolution of the wandering soul tapes to the viral dynamics of the online spectreware IREX2. The historical material presented in it is based on investigations of the audio recordings, reports, memoirs, photographs, and films that constitute the audit archive. The archive contains many files, which according to the unit still require decoding and transcribing. As the audit archive slowly unveils, new chapters of its missing history will be serially released through publications, recordings, further fleshing out the chronicle of martial ontology that has been pieced together thus far. Martial ontology expresses the memory of an unlived reality, arriving entire and intact, yet never before experienced. The sonic agents are not the only ones able to remember a different present, as they observe the third ear, with its capacity to summon spectral presences, exists within all of us, but they are willing to talk about it. Their extra, auditory, their extra auditory thinking is used for pushing, stretching, reversing and mutating sonic phenomena toward new levels of unsound potential. The obsessive researchers have a twofold concern, to activate a sonology of history and to reveal that reality, as well as theory, can be excavated from fiction. 
ultimately, martial ontology forces an engagement with the prospect that sonic fictions are already real. According to Kojo Eshen, the term sonic fiction can be understood as the convergence of the organization of sound with a fictional system, whose fragments gesture towards but fall short of the satisfactions of narrative. Add to this the internet, a realm that excels in speculation, rumor, and anonymity, and you get an idea of how fictional tactics enter into the operational dynamics of the actual and are well suited to the indeterminable sphere of sound. A sonic fiction brings together snippets of events, habits, objects, processes, at once pertaining to historicity and mythology. Odent eventually belong to an alternative sonic culture that includes the Afrofuturist, militant and spectral politicism of the likes of the Ramazi, Sun Ra, Underground Resistance and Drexkia, among others. Like them, Odent is concerned with contaminating the factual record, offering to those condemned to populate the darkest pages of history a way out. Sonic fiction becomes a weapon for the ostracized, used for unleashing the untold tales of history of an aquatic, underground, or underworld people yet to come. The practice lets loose characters and events that inhabit real but counterfeit worlds, those condemned to lurk in the shadows of actualized reality, the one that the majority of us evidently agree on. It stretches any rational notions of belonging to a singular temporality by opening up a channel between past, present, and future. As Eschen infers, sonic fiction is speculative theory embedded in science fiction. Science fiction reinterpreted as an analysis of the ongoing present, adding to that the extraction of concepts and using them as vehicles to get to somewhere new. It is an unconventional research method whose aim is to radicalize the speculative ghost in sound culture. It involves mobilizing new levels of possibility space, invites concept manufacture, spawns new languages, and demonstrates an indifference towards human knowledge. Sonic or phonofiction surpasses the limits of human knowledge by directly tapping into the artifacts and events rather than settling for their cultural analysis. Having had to come to terms with the unknowability of the world, as well as its existence without us and its complete indifference to us, Sonic fictional methods become a form of disorientation proper to the study of the present. As we learn from audience vibrational experiments, the present is yielding every possibility, which is something that J.G. Ballard said. And therefore studying it must necessarily involve the recognition of what is real without being actual, simultaneously of this world, an alien, radically different to us and therefore unknowable, as Jameson said. It seems inevitable then that phonofictions also echo Nick Land's reconfiguration of questioning as exploration, whose orienting vector runs from the known towards the unknown, rather than the other way around. The question, what if knowledge were a means to deepen unknowing? The sonic fictional methodology presupposes a rapture to knowledge and its opening up to partialities. This is also the domain of myth science, the field of research invented by Sun Ra, sound and fiction making reality, proliferating in probability, as Sun Ra said. Having gained this insight, audits are able to tap directly into the vibrational intelligence of the sonic, challenging the logic of applying philosophy to read culture. Books, records, artworks, and other pathogenic strategies, that's what they call pathogenic strategies, they produce are a hint that, as Guattari suspected, aesthetic utterances can anticipate scientific advances by decades. Their ongoing search for waves and vibrations that were previously unattainable is testament to the ways with which thinking sonically can strive to scout out something that runs counter to the normal order of things, and out of which new configurations may emerge. Audent, like Sanra and Drexkia, invoke worlds entirely possible without the coherence and order of our theoretical laws. The phonofictions break temporal continuity and generate a lawless real, one in which the trajectory of things cannot be modeled or guaranteed because it is not only unforeseen, but in principle unforeseeable. In that sense, sonic fiction could also be considered 
alongside vis-a-vis uh, -vis extra science fiction. What Quentin Mayesu identifies as the fiction of worlds entirely outside science. Whereas every science fiction implicitly maintains the axiom that in, in the anticipated future it will still be possible to subject the world to scientific knowledge, even if it is of transfigured laws yet to come, extra science fiction deals with worlds that are broadly regular but capable of unstable and absurd behavior. For May Su, these Humean worlds are populated by events literally engendered by nothing, he says. In other words, pure absurges ex nihilo. They are raptures that cannot rely on science for explanation as they belong to environments that have become unpredictable and unrecognizable. Crucially, extra science fiction refers not only to a world in the future, but requires an engagement with the notion that we already live in such a world, whose chaotic details have not yet appeared in a clear way. Much of Odin's work oscillates around sensing and teasing out other dimensions of reality lying tangent to this world. Its interventions flesh out the Ligotian idea that the only value of this world lays in its power at certain times to suggest another world. Those who enter the realm of Odin must succumb to the fact that they will never know whether they're driven away from or coming closer to a truth. A female voice on the vinyl relays to them that there is no one truth and that they themselves might be nothing more than biological puppets susceptible to recruitment by sonic forces outside the perception. Perhaps this should be called the Odin syndrome. At the polar extreme of the Cotard, oh, sorry, of the Cotard, Cotard uh, disorder, and those who believe themselves to be dead, there are those suffering from the condition of being somebody, going somewhere with something to do. Therefore, the delusion is common to both the living and the living dead. The madness is shared. Nobody comes out clean, nobody perhaps but the sonic algorithm. An entity within its own right, with its own logic, its own thoughts, its own interventions. A sound without us, arriving from origins unknown, or as Sadie Plant predicted, a code for the numbers to come. <laughs>